lot of demonstration on the screen, so if you want to get a good view, sit as close to the middle as you can. Good afternoon. Welcome to the program Cali Tips and Techniques for Cali Lessons and Other Applications. My name is Brian Huddleston. I'm the Senior Reference Librarian at Loyola University New Orleans Law School Library, and I've written two Cali Lessons on legal research. Last year, I wrote the lesson How to Find Case Law Using the Digests. Uh, when I first started getting interested in writing Cali Lessons, I had been playing around with uh, computer graphics for about six or seven years, taught myself a little bit, and it seemed to be a natural fit that a legal research lesson, because legal research deals with the law and the cases and statutes on the printed page and all these books we all have in our libraries, uh, so it was natural that you know, we put sample pages from the different resources into our lessons. Um, once I started that, I realized I didn't know quite as much about graphics as I thought I did, and there was a lot of trial and error, but eventually my lesson had 78 different graphics in it. I did things like uh, sample pages from reporters uh, where I emphasized different parts of the text, explained to the students what uh, were involved and what was included in the different uh, resources I covered. I did some photographs to talk about different sets of books. At first I thought I'd have the students, you know, do the lesson in the library and I'd tell them, all right, get up from your table and go get this book, bring it back and look at this page. No, no, that's not going to work. So that's why I used um, a whole bunch of graphics. Sometimes did some a little more abstract, just, you know, illustrate a minor point and to take up space and make it look nice and aesthetic. This past spring, I wrote the lesson, Introdu Introduction to Secondary Resources. Uh, I had sort of refined my techniques. It went a little more smoother. And it was a uh, smaller lesson, it only had 60 graphics in it, but again, similar sort of material, some collages, talking about uh, primary materials. Uh, I tried to emphasize to the students because there's secondary resources and, for example, treatises. There's a wide variety of treatises, so I did a little collage. And again, I used some sample pages talking about the primary resources, I mean, the uh, primary, secondary, the main secondary resources that I covered, again, just as an introduction, there are Cali lessons about these specific types of secondary resources that go into more detail than my introductory lesson did. Um, today's program is going to talk about graphics. It's going to be a detailed how-to. Cali's preference, I did a 17-page handout. I brought enough copies here for everybody. There's some at the end of all the tables. Um, this program is going to be nuts and bolts, details how to make these sort of graphics uh, so you can follow along and if you're interested in trying this at home, you can take this handout back with you and hopefully follow along um, and do it yourself. Um, the techniques will be useful for other things. Uh, again, my lessons were both in legal research. The law is the written word in all its different forms, so it's possible that these same techniques, these same sort of graphics could be useful in other uh, subject areas of Cali lessons. Uh, I use them a lot in slideshows. Um, you can use the same techniques to make, make, make uh, nice graphics. We did a handout back at our law library of the catalog and we did some screen captures and uh, marked it up so I was emphasizing different parts of it for the students. 
I'm going to try and keep the technical jargon at a minimum, uh, go over the basics. I'm no expert on graphics. I know there's people here who have worked with extensive uh, digitization projects probably. Uh, since this is the Cali Conference, I think we've got an above level of technical expertise amongst the membership and the attendees. Uh, so I know a lot of y'all probably know what I'm going to cover and probably know how to do it even better. Uh, but I hope and I believe there'll be something here that at least everyone uh, will be able to learn. And maybe you haven't figured out or haven't done it before. Um, if I confuse you, if I blow by something too fast, because I do tend to talk in a rapid manner, uh, don't hesitate, raise your hand, speak up. If it's confused one of you, it's probably confused most of you. So again, don't hesitate. And the handout has my web page, has my email address uh, where I've posted this if you need another copy of it once you get back to your uh, parent institution. The problem and the challenge I ran into when trying to represent the printed page on a computer screen is that a computer screen is a horizontal format. The long axis runs left to right. The printed page is a vertical format. The long axis runs up and down. Now you can squeeze in an entire page of text onto a computer screen. And this is actually somewhat readable. You see it's blurred. Um, uh, it's going to strain your eyes if you do a whole lesson looking like this. Uh, that wasn't satisfactory. You did see the whole page, but you couldn't read particular lines in it. Now you can zoom out and make the text much more readable, but then you don't see the whole page. You just see this chunk of it. You lose the context. You can read a couple of sentences. You don't know how it relates to the whole page. Now, first I had an inspiration. Uh, 20 years ago, Brian Eno, the musician, artist, had some long form uh, videos that were vertical format videos. The little label on the VHS box says, this is a vertical format video. Turn your television set on its side. I thought, brilliant. <laughs> I could fit a page of text perfectly on a computer screen if we just do it in a vertical format. Well, Kelly didn't like the idea, the vision of thousands of law students in the labs turning their monitors on the side uh, just didn't fly, so uh, they 86 that idea. The compromise I came up with was for the important pages I wanted to explain to the students, the important parts I wanted to emphasize, I'd take that scrunched up image fit it on the whole screen, but then the important parts of the text that I wanted to make sure was readable, I'd zoom out. And uh, this is the sort of graphic that I used extensively in uh, both my lessons. And again, nuts and bolts later, we're going to go step by step. And I've actually got uh, Photoshop up and running, and I'll show you how that's done. I wish we were in a lab setting, so it's hands-on. There's nothing that I like less than watching somebody demonstrate on a computer when I'm not there following along. But again, bear with me. You can follow along in the handout once we get to uh, that point. In any sort of graphics project, there's a basic three-step workflow. Image acquisition, image manipulation, and just to be grammatically similar, image exportation. That's just fancy for we're going to save it as some end product graphic. Image acquisition, you can obtain your original images from a number of sources. You can scan the printed material. You can take a picture with a digital camera. <clears throat> Use screen capture, which was mentioned in an earlier lesson and people have been talking about. Again, I think most of us are probably familiar with that. Um, it's a very valuable tool. If you're not familiar with it, I will cover some tips on how to use that and create graphics from images that you capture from your computer screen. You can get graphics from clip art collections. You can get graphics found on the web, albeit many of them subject to copyright, so you have to be careful when you use those. Or you can draw your own, and I'm not going to go, going to go in a lot of detail about drawing your own, but you'll see some of the basic tools I use to mark up a graphic. Now, for the Cali authors out here, people thinking about writing Cali lessons, Cali off, does offer some graphical support. You can tell them what they want, and they've got good staff who will create it or work with the graphics. You saw in my first lesson I had 78 graphics. I knew what I wanted them to be. I knew I had those primary resources in my law library. That was going to be a lot of email back and forth explaining to them, sending images back and forth. Um, and if you've got any vision 
and any computer skills, which I know we all have, this is not difficult. Again, I'm no expert. I'll show you basics, you know, how to do it later on. Uh, it just for me, it was easier doing it myself because I know what I wanted uh, my lesson to have. Uh, I'm not going to talk so much about the last three methods. Again, I'll talk about screen captures later in the program. Digital cameras are now uh, very reasonably priced. Uh, I've got one, it's a three megapixel. It was less than 150, 160 at Walmart. The pictures I took for my two lessons, you saw the picture of the Northwestern Digest earlier. That was all taken on an old one meg megapixel, actually the still picture uh, option of a digital camcorder. Those were fine. Three megapixels, a very modestly priced, modestly featured camera will do fine for whatever sort of graphics like I've done if you want to do some yourself. But primarily, if you're going to be creating graphics of print materials, you're going to be scanning those materials from uh, the original sources yourself. And so briefly, I'd like to talk about scanning, just the absolute minimum you need to know. Most software that comes with uh, scanners has both a basic pre-configured mode and it has an advanced expert or professional mode. Use that advanced mode because we're going to want to tweak some of these settings uh, from the basic setup that comes uh, in the uh, basic scanner mode. If it's a printed uh, text of page, yes, let's scan it in black and white or grayscale mode. You could take a color scan of a black and white page. It's going to suck up more hard drive space. Uh, black and white for black and white page obviously is preferred. Uh, I've had the best results scanning at a high resolution. Those of you all who have done any sort of large-scale digitization projects knows you know you probably, for most materials, don't need to use a, a resolution this high. But again, when we get to the step-by-step -step proportions, I'm going to use this original scan. I'm going to use it in several different ways, and I want an original large uh, resolution image uh, for my starting point when I start working with these images. If your scanner supports it, I've had the best results saving that image as a TIFF. If not a TIFF, a high quality, minimally compressed JPEG. And if you know anything about digital graphics, you know that these last two factors are going to result in large images, both in the image dimension, and we're talking you know, a page of text, 300 dot per inch, is going to be anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 pixels wide and maybe 2,500, 3,000 pixels tall. That's huge. The file size, the amount of memory it takes up in your hard drive is going to be large, anywhere from three to five, maybe six or seven megabytes. These are our archival images. All the graphics that I've worked with exist in three formats, my original scan, my work in progress, and then I eventually export it into a usable format, resize it, uh, make it a common format like a GIF or a JPEG, but my original are these high resolution, uh, detailed, for me, TIFF, and uh, if not a TIFF, uh, again, a uh, minimally compressed JPEG. Image manipulations where the bulk of the work's done. If you just want a plain image, you can probably scan it directly, get it at the size you need, and import it into your uh, end product. Uh, but you saw the images earlier. I did a lot of manipulation, zooming in, emphasizing, highlighting. Uh, this is where I want to talk briefly about uh, some software. I used Photoshop uh, for all my graphics in my two lessons. Uh, Photoshop has a lot of advanced image and photograph manipulation tools. It's you know great for fun things like taking a picture of your dog and inserting him into famous historic scenes or even uh, historic scenes, even historic scenes that didn't actually take place, or screen captures from holiday movies to make you know that great Christmas card to send to your friends and family. Uh, Photoshop is the gold standard of graphics software. It's pricey. The full version runs for over $600, even with an academic discount. You're talking $300. For the sort of graphics, just manipulating images of text like I did for the Cali lessons, you don't need all those high-end uh, tools. But luckily, Adobe has a version of Photoshop, which is essentially Photoshop Lite, uh, Photoshop Elements 2.0, 99 list, $50 with an academic discount. The other big software for uh, graphic work out there, PaintShop Pro, now in version 8, is comparably priced to Photoshop Elements. 
Again, it'll do everything that I would need it to do to the sort of graphics that I've created for Cali, probably for anything that uh, would be comparable to it. Paint Shop Pro, I've played with all of these. The last page of the handout has information about the software, uh, the web addresses for where you can get them. Uh, both Photoshop Elements and Paint Shop Pro come in a fully functioned, time-limited version that you can try out, and that's what I did. Uh, I tried everything I'll talk about today with both those, and they uh, worked in both those software. Paint Shop Pro, it's a different company. The menus, the command, the jargon's all slightly different. Uh, both products are very well documented. Adobe particularly has some very good, very detailed uh, manuals that come with all of its products. All right, image manipulation. This is where we get to the uh, detailed nuts and bolts and roughly start, I think it's page 10 of the handout down at the bottom, I list these steps. And this is where, again, if I blow past something, be sure to raise your hand so uh, I can go over it again. This can all be done again. Photoshop Elements 2.0 and Paint Shop Pro, the jar will be just a little different. This is a page that was an original scan. Uh, you can tell by the title, it's from CJS. It's about products liability. It's a TIFF. It's 5.4 megabytes. It's a big file. Let me open that up in Photoshop. The navigator over here is this tool that lets you resize it on the screen. It gives you a percentage readout. This is 50%. You also see that up at the title bar. At 100% maximized, it's a huge image can hide the tool menus on Photoshop with the tab key. You see that that's like what we saw earlier on the Cali screen. You can read the text, but it's so big you can't see the huge, the, you can't see the entire screen. Now if you're going to do a lot of graphics work, and again, this is a TIFF, it's readable at all these levels, zooming in and out, very useful because we'll be taking different parts of this and resizing it for my uh, end image that I use in Cali lessons. Um, if you're going to be doing a lot of graphics work, particularly if they're going to be graphics of the same sort of thing and you're going to be using them in the same application, I know what I skipped over. Okay. Image manipulation. Before we get into the nuts and bolts, I was looking at the clock saying, wow, I finished that quick. All right. <laughs> one, more, one more important detail before we get into the nuts and bolts. When working with images, you need to consider what the optimal image target size that you're going to create. And that depends on the application you're going to use. You saw my graphics, my screen captures in my slideshow here. For slideshows, it's easy. Uh, slideshows display at the full uh, resolution of the screen, so whatever your compu computer you're using, whatever it's set at, whatever you're going to have it set for your presentation, that's what you can use for your maximum usable graphic size. This laptop set for 1,024 pixels by 768. 800 by 600 was a standard up until a couple of years ago. Uh, like I said, this is set for 1024 by 768. Most, and you see some statistics I have in a minute, most, are, most computers are at least set for that high resolution. Some typically are set even higher. Uh, in Cali, Considerations are a little different because students all over the country may have computers with screens set at different resolutions. And the statistics I found was based on what, what web servers and a couple of websites were measuring how many of their users had uh, screens set at different resolutions. Uh, 37 to 39 percent had a resolution of 800 by 600, 50 percent or more had a screen resolution of 1,024 by 768 or higher. Now it's important in Cali because of essentially issues of backwards and forwards capa compatibility issue. Here's the blank Cali screen reminding me to save my book. Uh, on Cali you don't have the full screen available to you. You've got the toolbar across the top, you've got the status bar at the bottom, and you've got these uh, blue borders on the side. So the effective available image is only equal to roughly this portion of your screen, the white space in the middle. Now you can load a Cali, you can load a lesson, in, you can load an image into Cali that's larger than this area, but it's going to be automatically resized. And maybe some of y'all have seen this. 
I found this out when I was doing my first lesson. If you load a lesson, if you have a graphic that's bigger than that Kali screen size, it's going to do something like this. Watch as the, less, as the graphic loads. See how it resizes? It blinks in. Starts at its original size and Kali scrunches it up. Now this is a graphic with some large text on it. It's easily readable, but if you can, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, the, arrow, the arrows are all a little jagged. Some of the edges of the letters are distorted. If you view this in Photoshop, it's smoothed out. Kali resizes it. And if that image is too bigger and the text that you're trying to get people to read is small, it may be distorted to the point where you can't read it. There's a couple of lessons that I found. If you're viewing it at 800 by 600 resolution, those graphics get scrunched down and the text isn't readable. Now, most students, I believe, are now, and uh, let's see, there's my screen. This is in the handout, optimized for 800 by 600. The biggest useful resolution for a full screen graphic like this is 430 high by 600 pixels wide. For a half screen resolution, which gives you space for a couple of paragraphs on the left, about 430 high by 300 wide. Um, both my lessons were optimized for 800 by 600. Again, they display fine at bigger resolutions. The graphics just take up a smaller size. The reverse is not true. But I think we can be comfortable now, mid-2004, that most students will have available a 10,000 by 24 by 678 screen resolution on both their lab computers and the home computers. So you have a larger workable space. And again, at this, at a full screen, a uh, full screen image at this resolution, you have basically a graphic space of 600 pixels high by 840 wide. Again, without Kali resizing it and scrunching your graphic together, and a half screen size of 600 pixels high and 420 wide. And I'll show you in Photoshop and it works the same way in PaintShop Pro how you can check your image size and scale it and uh, crop it off. Um, and that was when I realized I had blown past that in Photoshop because I think that brings me back to my yeah my sample image again at ten at 1024 by 768 this graphic is exactly 600 high and roughly 420 wide again those numbers are in the handout uh, along with the same sort of screen image there this is again back to my scanned in image this is scanned in. This is a TIFF image of a page from CGS, the topic products liability. Right now, again, displayed at 25%. If you're going to be doing a lot of graphics work, it might be useful to, keep, to create sort of a generic template. And that's what this is, template.psd. PSD is the Photoshop uh, proprietary image, PaintShop Pro. It's a .psp. Now, these are images you can't import directly into Kali and the PowerPoint, but again, that third step, we're going to convert and save the image as something you can use in most standard uh, computer programs. This is a template. It's got two layers to it. I'll talk about more about layers in a second. It's got a background layer I don't have exposed right now because I wanted to show the border layer at the top is transparent. It's hard to see because it's gray, but if I zoom in, you can sort of see this gray line over in the side, on the side. That's just a little border sort of a drop shadow image, just took a gray pencil around the edge. PaintShop Pro has a tool that will automatically do a little drop shadow. That's what you see in a lot of computer graphics to give you the illusion of depth. Makes it look like there's an actual page or something on the computer screen. This has just got a little gray shadow around the edge, drop shadow. This is my template. I can check the size, image, image size. It's right at 420 pixels wide, 600. Uh, high. I created that because I knew that's my target graphic. That's what I wanted all my graphics and my lessons to be. I made the little border and I made the rest of that border transparent. So, I've got two images open. Switch back and forth. Here's my TIFF. Just to give you an idea, that TIFF scanned in was, again, 100% image, 300 dots per inch. Uh, came out to be 1900 pixels wide, 28 pixel, 2800 pixels uh, high very big, but again, I can work with it and do a lot with it, and it'll keep this clear readability. Uh, <clears throat> first step is to make this image, make my full page version of this to fit into my template. So, under height, 
Let's change that to 600. We've got constrained proportions, so it'll automatically resize both the height and the width. And again, it's displayed at 25%, so once I resize it, it's still displayed at 25 cents. It's a small image, but it'll look roughly the same it did now at 100%. I'm going to copy that over into my template, use edit, uh, select all, keyboard sh shortcut, control A. Now I've got this dotted, jagged line around it. It means I've selected that whole image. Edit, copy, or control C. That copies it to the Windows memory buffer, essentially. Now back on template. Now watch on the right here. I've got two layers open. That's my layers tab. I've got a layer called border, a layer called background. Uh, there's my background visible now. So edit, paste, and it pastes my text in as a new layer. Every time you paste something new into a Photoshop file, it creates that as another layer. Now notice I've still got some of my transparency showing through the edges here. I can just make my white border visible by clicking on its eyeball icon, and that shows through. Now again, three layers, white background, layer of text, and then that gray drop shadow border. All three are now visible. Layer one, the layer I just pasted in, is one that's active. If I do anything, paint, and draw on it, it's going to affect that layer. Notice it gave me a generic layer one. I like to give that a name. Right click, layer option. Let's just call it full text. Once I get up to six or seven layers, it's useful to have all those uh, layers labeled so I know what each layer is. All right, now what about that old TIFF I resized? Notice it's still selected here. I don't want to save it with that resize because I still want to keep it as my archival old image. Now, if I wanted to, I could make that a, a read-only file so it wouldn't let me do it. I didn't get that far, but if you know about file uh, properties in Windows, you know how to change that. So contrary, and I don't have Edit Undo available, Got undo deselect because that was my last command. This version of Photoshop only goes back one command as far as your undo. Uh, if I screw something up, like let's say I draw on here, realize I didn't want to do that, control Z, edit undo will let me undo that most immediate command. Uh, your more recent versions of most of the software has a list of commands. You can actually go back several steps and undo an earlier command. The option I have here is just to close it and counter to all good habits when it asks me do I want to save these changes, carefully realizing that no, this is my TIFF, I want to keep it at that archival large image size, I'm going to click no. So then when I go back and open it again, it's still at that large resolution. Now I've still got my template open, but I've added that new element, that full page of text. I want to keep my template available for other uh, manipulations and create new files, so I'm going to give this a new name, file, save as, let's call it CJS1, and notice I can only save it as a Photoshop, fo Photoshop format, that's because it's got these multiple layers. This is their proprietary format, I save that. This is essentially my second version of this file. This is my work in progress. I've got my archival TIFF, I've got my work in progress PSD then eventually I'm going to save it as a JPEG or GIF, and that's what I'll ultimately use in my end application. All right, back here to my full TIFF. Let's zoom in and say it was the heading of this subsection B, allergic reactions to products I wanted the students to focus on. It's really too small to easily read here without straining your eyes but it's that big resolution here. I can use my marquee tool. This is what I use if I want to select part of an image. I can, cons I can select that image. Again, this is my TIFF. It's just got one layer. This is my archive version. I'm not going to make any end changes to the it. Edit, copy. Now, it's a very big image, so if I try to copy it directly over there, it's still too big to read. Now, again, I just copied it. I screwed that up. I can do edit, undo, and it goes back one change. What I need to do is resize just that chunk of text. I can't resize just one layer, but what I can do is create a temporary file, file, new, 
And notice the dimensions. I've got this chunk of text, my full resolution TIFF, hanging out in memory. Photoshop says, oh, you want to paste something. I bet you want to paste it at the image, res at the, uh, image size of this chunk of text you just uh, copied. And that's what the image resolution is. Now, that's set at 67.67%. This is at 100%. So to get an idea what size you want to resize this chunk of text to, let's view them both at 100% or go back and refresh our memory. That work in progress Photoshop file is 420 pixels wide. If I go back, let's say I want to make it about three-fourths the size because I want it to be hanging out over my full text, uh, but I still want it to be readable. So let's try resize command is under image, image size. Let's try a width of 375. Click OK, and it resizes it. Notice this, I don't have a name for this file. This is just something temporary because the only thing I'm going to do now is select that chunk, again, resize to small format, edit, copy, go back to my, again, work in progress Photoshop file, edit, paste. Then there it is hanging out. Notice it created a new layer. Let's call the layer over here. properties. All right, I've blanked out. I don't see my layer property. Layer options. There it is. Layer options. Let's call this zoom in text. I hope everybody realizes this is going to be a nuts and bolts sort of technical presentation. I'm not talking theory or pedagogy here. They assured me that was okay, that it is okay to do some, hand, some you know, detailed how to do stuff here. Um, notice I created a new layer. This layer is floating around here. Again, if I want to work with just it, I can make my other layers temporarily invisible because that's what I'm going to do next. I've copied it over. It's about the right proportion to the rest of my text here. Uh, again, that untitled file is still hanging out there. I don't need it anymore. I can close it. Again, it's going to warn me about to lose it if I save it. As long as you keep straight all these steps and what you do and you realize, yeah, that's right. It's just a temporarily resized chunk of text I captured from on my full TIFF, say no. Now I've just made a change to my work in progress. I want to save it. So I'll make sure my changes. Now I've still got, these are all different layers, but I can turn them on and off at will. Uh, put the zoom in layer right about where we want it. And if you notice from my Sample image, which this is starting to look like. I think it's like a cooking show, like Emerald. Here's what it's going to look like once it's done. Here it is in progress. I've got a layer on it so it'll stand out a little bit better. Right now, you got that wet white text blending in to uh, other text. Uh, if I wanted to, I could draw directly on this layer. But if I realize layer, later, well, I actually wanted my lines a little different, uh, I've already permanently change that layer where that zoom in text is. Uh, so I'd have to go back and capture it again for my full tip or create a new layer just for the lines I'm going to draw. I can do that for my little menu here or again for my layer menu up here, new layer. Let's call this my lines layer. More like a cooking show if I had a little band here and we could go to them every time the audience got bored, but okay, bear with me. I can show more pictures of the dog, I guess. All right, now I've got a separate lines layer. And right now there's nothing on it, but take my lines tool. To the right up here, one of my tabs is options. All the tools in Photoshop and PaintShop Pro have options where you can tweak different things. Um, I've already got this set. I want it three pixels wide. Let me just quickly draw some lines. If I don't hold any key down, it doesn't constrain it to any particular straight line. If I hold the shift key down, it constrains it to either the horizontal vertical or diagonal axis to make a nice straight line. So I'm going to hold the shift key down, again my lines tool, click and drag, drag, oops, move my mouse, click and drag. I can also do it with my pencil tool, that one didn't match up just right. Pixel, pencil tool at about that size, 
For some reason, the later versions of Photoshop, as far as I can determine, don't have that pencil, don't have that line tool anymore. Uh, this is Photoshop 4. That's what I've used for all my lessons. All right, notice that's a different layer. I've just got this line thing floating around there. Now, I, was ma I made sure that my zoom text was where I wanted it because if I drag it around, I've got to drag the uh, line around to fix it, uh, to fit back on it again. Now, I just dragged it, edit, undo, brings it back to where it was before. All right, that's my zoomed in text. I want to indicate to the students where that came from. Now, make sure you're still on the lines layer. Go back to the lines tool, and I usually use a smaller line width. Let's go back to one pixel because it's going to be a line floating over the original, original full size text that students really can't read, but it gives them a context. Notice, well, this is the part of a heading. And in my text, I discuss, well, at the beginning of each subject, subsection in CJS, uh, the general rule is stated and then further discussed. There it is again. They don't match up just right, but I'm doing it quick on the fly. You can go back with your eraser and tweak it and uh, work with it some more. Again, that's just my lines layer. If I turn it off, you see those lines are just floating over there. The layers, easy way to think about it is like different layers of transparency on, on an old overhead projector. I just roll back each successive transparency, and you can see the underlying layers. And I roll it back, and you see my lines around it, and whatever I don't have on that one transparency, whatever's not taken up by the image on it, the other layers below it show through. So I just peel them back one by one, and eventually you see the underlying text. Next, I'm going to do some diagonal lines. Uh, I'm going to make this anti-aliased. That makes it look like it's not just a series of bumps, but rather gives you an illusion that it's more of a contiguous straight line. Corner to corner, and we get that zoom in effect there. So the students can read the little top paragraph of this subsection B. And they know, well, it comes from this subsection of uh, sections 26 to 27 of products liability in CJS. Now, let's say I wanted them to focus particularly on one word or phrase out of this zoomed-in text. Another tool I use a lot is um, highlight. I can select my colors here, find a nice highlighter-looking yellow. Now, several ways I could do it, paint and draw, circle it. But what did I just do? I drew straight on that layer. Now, it's lines, so you're not going to... You're not going to affect anything unless you cross over the line. But what I usually try to do just to keep all my elements separate is, again, create a new layer. Let's call this one Highlights. And again, if I paint over it, you all know, saw me adjust it because it was from earlier. I can set the opacity of all my tools if I wanted to just draw a half transparent. Let's make it a little larger. A half transparent highlight. So it shows through like that, and again, on a separate highlight layer. Or if you're going to highlight a larger chunk of text and don't want to draw the multiple lines, select the text you want to highlight, like the beginning of the uh, sentence there, and use my paint bucket tool. My paint bucket's going to paint it at that color. I set my opacity to something like roughly 65%. Makes the underlying text readable depending on how clear the text is, what color you're going to use to highlight. You might want to play with that opacity some. But again, that's a separate layer. If I decide I don't want that, I can just delete that layer and start all over again. I didn't paint directly on the underlying text. It's on a separate layer. The other element, the last little bit uh, that is this example is the gray out. Uh, all this white space sort of blurs together, even with the lines there. I like the students to be able to focus on, well, I'm just directing your attention to this one part of the text. So if I want to do a layer just over the full text image, let me go down there and select my, again, that's my full text image there hanging out in the background. Add a new layer there. Now we're up to, what is that, eight layers. Let me call this gray layer. And Select a nice neutral gray color there. My paint bucket tool. And I probably want it a little 
more op little less opaque than 65% because this is going to be gray over black and white text. So let's go down about 30, 34. And again, it's on a separate layer. There's nothing else there. I pour my gray paint. Notice it's under my zoomed in text because the zoomed in, the layers and the lines are all above it. And again, the stack of layers, just like layers of transparencies on an overhead projector. Uh, the only thing that I don't have is I didn't need to highlight I didn't need to gray out this text, so I just use my marquee tool, select roughly, and again, I'm on the gray layer. I'm going to select roughly that same part of the underlying image that's indicated by my small font line and just delete it. There I've got my little window on the big gray layer. I've zoomed in on it with my zoomed in text, made lines over it, highlighted one line, and I've got my border around the whole thing. There's a little black border that's actually part of Photoshop, but when you export it, if you don't have anything border, if you don't have any border of it, that white part of the page is just going to bleed over into the white part of the application that you export this image to. Um, want to be sure and save it. Save it and save often. And again, this is still Photoshop format, multi-layer. I'm not going to be able to import it directly, but a third step, import image exportation, i.e. convert or save as. Tally will take a GIF or JPEG, that's standard, that's the ones you see in most uh, graphic software. If I go to File, Save As, it's not going to give me an option besides Photoshop because, again, it's proprietary. It's got all these layers in it. Uh, JPEGs and GIFs don't support those multiple layers, so the command I have to use is flatten image. It's available from the menu here and from the layer image at the top, flatten image. And there it's compressed all those layers. It's like melting all those transparencies down to one thick piece of plastic. Now they're all one layer, and I can't do anything with them. Now what do I want to do? I don't want to save this as a single layer PSD. I can always come back to it, but I'm going to go ahead and save it as my JPEG, and now I'm going to go save as I've got my JPEG option there. The next option that pops up in Photoshop, it asks you for a quality. This is how you can specify the amount of compression in your JPEGs. JPEGs are used on the web a lot because you can compress them way down without much noticeable loss of quality. With just a black and white image like we have here with a tiny splash of highlighted color, and zoom that quality way down. All of mine, in my second lesson at least, I didn't realize it was with my first lesson, but because Cali lessons, uh, there's a version of all the lessons that, most of the lessons and all the new ones that are on the web, uh, you want to minimize your graphics as much as possible so they can be downloaded and run over the web easily. So I'm going to step mine down to quality one, and it's just as visible. Now again, if I wanted to go back and edit, and this is my my third version of this graphic. This is my export image. It's at the image size I want. Uh, done all my image manipulation, and I've saved it now as a JPEG, CJS1.jpg. If I realize, well, maybe I wanted the highlight somewhere else, or you know, I want to select a different part of the text, or change something else, I can go back, and I've also got in my second format that work in progress, that Photoshop file.psd, and there it is. If I want, well, let's just, we don't need to highlight that. Let's just highlight the phrase. Boop. Highlight layer, delete. Let's just highlight the phrase, generally no duty to warn of harm. And again, this is just a graphic. You're going to be explaining it. I explain in all my lessons with the text out to the side so that I know the students are, you know, looking at the part of the image I'm referring to say look at the highlighted image you know the highlighted text and the zoomed out portion of the image from CJS that's right so there I can change my PSD export it again this time let's just for comparison purposes I did this just to reassure myself that it looked fine at these lower resolutions file save it as let's call this CJS2 it's the same file but now let's step oh I just screwed that up I didn't change it to JPEG. Oh, I, I've just indelibly merged all my layers together. It's okay. I've done this like five times in the last two days, and this is the last one I have to do. 
Save as. Now let's change it over to JPEG. CJS2, JPEG. Now we get the options. Let's step it back up to the maximum. Again, uncompressed JPEG or minimally jet compressed JPEG, high quality. Save it. Put the two side by side. And there's there's virtually no noticeable difference. I've looked at them and can't tell any difference. But as far as file size, CJS1 is 64 kilobytes. CJS2 at a quality of 10 is 198. You get a third file saving there. And we have our first question. No, and that was one point that I think I addressed in the handout, but I blew past here. Uh, my template, when I create a new image on Kali, you can specify it. And my, I think my template was at 72. When you cut and paste into the new, into an existing format, into existing file, it converts that pasted, that 300 DPI chunk of text from the TIFF file into 72 DPI on the pasted into image. And because the, the resulting JPEG is, a, I think, I think 72 dot power inch is a standard. So yeah. And this is the format image that you can import into Kali. Go back to the author. My too big example again. Those of y'all aren't familiar with it, very easy to work with Kali as far as images. Click on picture, browse over to the file. How to CJS1. Then display it as a student. Let's save our book. Ah, oh, did this to me like three out of four times. I've got a lot of stuff open, and those of y'all who've worked with Kali author know that it's a memory hound. So I've been massaging this thing every time I do it. But the imported image will look roughly like that. All right, I'm going to take about five minutes. We're going to talk about screen captures. Then uh, I'll take any questions at the end of the uh, presentation. Showed you how to export our image. Close these down. Screen capture. That's the print screen button on all Windows computers. It's part of the Windows operating system. Uh, the Apple OS has a couple of uh, screen capture tools. You can actually do a couple more things with the built-in screen capture tools on at least OS 10. I'm not sure about earlier versions. It will take anything you can display in any software and essentially convert it to any graphic format in any other application. I've indicated as far as I know. I've tried this with everything I can think of. Haven't found something where it didn't work. If y'all are aware of something, please let me know. To me, it might as well be magic. I know something about programming. I'm not sure how this works. All I can assume is that there's some Microsoft generic universal graphic format that it dumps into every application when you use that. Um, so for example, take my, my images here. The way I made some of my uh, images both for the presentation and for the uh, handout was, print, was a print screen. Word perfect up. One, as WordPerfect comes up, let me note that there's one useful tool that I really just found out about recently. It's the Clipboard Viewer. You can run it by edit run CLIPBRD. The executable is Clipboard CLIPBRD dot EXE. It's in the handout. There's the viewer. There's the chunk of text I just captured. That's what's currently in the memory buffer. I can paste that directly into WordPerfect. Now it, you can hear the hard drive rumbling. I guess that's Windows converting it. This is now a graphic in WordPerfect format, essentially a bitmap, I believe. Uh, you can edit it. You can draw on it with the WordPerfect tools. If you want to get zinned out, you should have seen me making some of the graphics of print of uh, Paint Shop Pro, I mean uh, Photoshop, doing images of Photoshop 
within Photoshop. I sat around and did this about seven or eight times and just fried my brain about. Um, the clipboard viewer is useful because even though, and notice this is clipboard viewer showing Adobe Shop superimposed over Adobe Photoshop. Uh, it's useful because even though Photoshop has a edit purge clipboard function, I couldn't always get to work and sometimes Photoshop would freeze up on me if I was trying to do subsequent screen captures. So if you're going to be doing a lot of screen captures, um, it's useful to have that clipboard and after you've pasted it, delete it because then it clears that for your next screen capture. One very useful thing I found out in one of my Cali lessons, I wanted to make a chart. Um, and if you don't know, the uh, text that you write in Cali Author is essentially HTML based. You can do tables. It can get really tedious. Uh, I just made a chart with WordPerfect, print screen, went to Photoshop. Now it's capturing the whole screen. You can use Alt Print Screen to capture just the active window. If you've got multiple in windows on top and you just need a small chunk of it captured. There's my chart. It's at 67%, so it's looking a little distorted. Edit Crop. Back up. Export it as a JPEG. Flatten my layers. And that's how I got a chart. Uh, into Cali in a useful, quick way. Again, I'm doing this quickly. This is what we've done before. That's my screen capture from, again, WordPerfect. WordPerfect actually has a lot of clip art and some fun things you can do with it that's actually easier than doing it in a, a Photoshop. There's a little clip art I made, the image and some text. Same way, print screen. Ooh, but what didn't I do? Did I clear it? Oh, there it is. There it is in the clipboard viewer. File new. Paste. There's my coffee machine. Crop that down. Flatten layers. JPEG. That one way down. It's just a bitmap, well, originally in WordPerfect. Uh, so it should look just fine at this image resolution. Back to the, oh yeah, my Cali Author crashed on me, didn't it? Okay. That was my last thing. I was going to paste that into Cali Author. Um, print screen, again, very useful. Uh, done a lot of slideshows where I've captured uh, both. Oh, that was the other thing. Yes, 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 yes. As far as legal research and other legal materials that you might be uh, creating, either slideshow or uh, Cali lesson from Adobe Photoshop, I mean uh, Adobe Acrobat Reader, uh, PDF files. You can get a lot of primary information in PDF files. Now, let me clear my clipboard viewer. Now, from within the free Adobe Acrobat Viewer, you can't convert it to other format, but ding, ding, screen capture. Adobe Acrobat Reader 5, I'm not sure about 4 has the, but 5 has the feature, 3 does not. You can rotate it clockwise so that I get that full view of my image. Zoom in a little more. I want my original, again, to be as big as possible. Capture that. There it is. I can zoom it. I can rotate it back around in Photoshop, and there's my full version of the uh, page. So anything you can get in PDF. Oh, there it is including several years worth of case law from Westlaw, law reviews from Hine Online, and all this great stuff from GPO Access. You don't need to scan in those materials. If you can get it in PDF, you can use Windows, again, built-in print screen application uh, 
to copy and paste it into directly into WordPerfect, directly into Word. You can use those editing tools to do some minimal work, or again, Photoshop or PaintShop Pro and uh, work with it there. Are there any questions over anything I've covered so far? Thank you. Um, yeah, it, I, that actually wouldn't matter because it's going to capture whatever it sees on the screen, even if it's a multi-layer JPEG, I mean multi-layer PSD file, which I don't have anymore. But it does, again, magic. Whatever is on the screen is going to be captured. That's how I did this huge collage on my, uh, how I did the collage here. I captured a couple of, uh, well, several applications. The splash screens, and that was a little tricky. You can get software that'll actually do more screen capture stuff for you. This is all using just the basic built-in. You actually, some of the software will time it, so it'll say, we'll count down five seconds and capture what you have. So if you've got to open some menu and your fingers are all used up, you can use one of these software programs to do that. Any other questions? Yes. Allie does. I didn't have to do it. That was one of the things they said up up front. They're very good about that. I got them a long list. Here's all the pages I use from the books. They took care of it, as far as I know. We haven't been sued yet, have we? Does anybody know? Yes. Right. Right, but when I, each image is going to have different things in those layers, and whenever I paste something in, it automatically creates it as a new layer. Yeah. Um, so it just add, it just builds it on. Yeah, it just builds it on there. Um, other questions? To do animation in Cali? That was quite, I forgot to repeat the questions. I apologize to the web audience, including my lovely wife, Emily. Hello. Um, to animate it, to actually move the image, the zoom text over, as opposed to the illusion of it zoomed in like this, to actually have it moving over it, like with 3D glasses? I mean, oh, could your image be a pop up within the, the Cali author pop up? Yeah, yeah, you can. Let me close down some of this stuff before I burn the computer up. Yeah, yeah, and in fact, I I can't remember if I used. I know you. I know you can. I know. I think some people have done it. Yeah, you can. Okay. Okay, yeah, so yes, um, you can put, yeah, because the pop-ups are just another type of Cali screen. And you can, anything you can do with your basic Cali book page, I believe you can do with a pop-up. In fact, I've got two more minutes here. Let's try that real quick. Um, add page, test, and it asks me what type, right, pop-up. Yeah, and there's my picture. I can put a picture in there. Let's do where's my coffee. So now it's a pop-up. Um, I don't have it linked from anywhere right now. But, uh, yeah, so you can make a graphic of a pop-up. And I think you said, oh, it's a, it's a loose leaf lesson. Oh, an image map. Right, right. Yeah, you can, yes, on, on Cali you can, right, right, so, right, right, I see. Um, so that was a loose leaf lesson, and it, what were they tabs of? Okay. Okay, and so when you clicked on the tab of on the image of the loose leaf, it popped up the page that a viewer would see if they actually turned to the tab. Maybe, maybe. 
an explanation of it. Okay. How Zen. Anyway, but yeah, your question was, yeah, you can do graphics in pops up. Web. Another question? True. Right. No. Not not for the uh, 100% visually disabled. The, que the question for our web audience was uh, visually impaired users and how they would access these graphics. And you're right, there's a is it like an alternate tab tag in HTML so that you could have a word description of your image. Yes. Um, and to be honest, I've never been at a library at a law school where we've had a where we've had a visually impaired student, so I don't have any idea what the uh, considerations are for teaching legal research to somebody who's either you know significantly impaired or completely blind. But that's yeah, very important consideration to keep in mind. It's two o'clock right now. We've got a half hour break. I believe strongly in the Cali project and. The web address for this handout and my email email address is on the handout itself. Feel free to contact me anytime here at the conference. Email me at home with any questions you might have about graphics. Thank you for staying with me through this presentation.